Welcome along to the RT Rugby Podcast. We are into December now, and so in this World Cup year, it is time to turn towards the Champions Cup, the Investec Champions Cup, to give it its new name. Slightly new format this year. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Joining us this week, we have JP Cooney, back with us again after a, a strong debut performance last week. JP, welcome back. Thanks, Neil. And uh, Johnny Murphy also on the line. Morning, fellas. Good to have you on. Cheers. Thanks for having us. Um, Plenty to get through. I'm going to start at the sports ground on Saturday night. That was the big game of the BKT United Rugby Championship. Connacht 22, Leinster 24. I think that's probably a good place to to jump off and we'll work our way through URC and Champions Cup as we go. But um, JP, Connacht 22, Leinster 24. Uh, Connacht are going to be kicking themselves. They lost this one. I know they had to come from behind in the second half, but... If you look at the way Leinster scored their try uh, tries and when they got their tries, the first one was from a position where Connacht, I think, had won a penalty in their own half and end up turning it over for um a little bit of bad sportsmanship stuff. And then in the second half, they have they get in front in the final ten minutes, have multiple opportunities to kill off the clock, and eventually let Leinster come back in at them. Considering now that there are four wins and three defeats out of seven games. Like the league table should be looking a lot different from a Connacht point of view, and that can't be sitting right with them. Yeah, um, hundred percent on everything you said there, Neil. And looking at the, I was there in the sports grounds, um, at the weekend. Safe to say, Connacht, um, they were the architects of their of their own downfall there. Um, like playing a team like Leinster, um, a team if you know a team like Leinster when they make mistakes. Uh, you have to punish them. You absolutely have to punish them. And you mentioned there about the first try where Charlie, I think it was Charlie Natai, crashed out over the line from five yards. Um, if you look at the, 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 I suppose, the sequences of plays that led up to that, I know we, you spoke specifically there about the, the head guard incident after the, the, the scrum. Um, Connacht had like three defensive sets, three very good defensive sets, five yards from the line where they were, you know, holding Leinster out. Um, Leinster attack wasn't probably as good as what we would have seen it in 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 other at other times. Um, but I think it was three times that Connacht either turned over the ball, won a scrum. Um, I think JJ had once said JJ Hanner and cleared the ball. He should have put the ball off the pitch, and Leinster came straight back down on the counter attack again. Connacht having to work so hard, so hard, so hard, and then eventually they win a scrum win a penalty in the scrum and what should have been a clear the line, you know, pressure release valve at that point, just a small, silly little thing of grabbing the head guard. And like, you know, there was two packs there in on top of each other. It's easy to single out someone. Um, I think it was Ryan Baird's head guard that Seamus Hurley Langton grabbed, like the tallest man on the pitch. Of course, a ref is going to see someone pulling at his head guard. Um, penalty reversed, uh, kick to the corner, Leinster don't get any change out of the line out. Charlie Natta hits it up. Unfortunate high contact from Carl Ford. I don't think he could have done much about it. And then it's just Leinster. Like, it, the way they practice their five-yard uh, tap and go, I'd I, I say they look at it as nearly another set piece. Yeah, um, they're the best around us. They're the yeah, best. 100%. The deception then to, for the forward pod to shift out. Connacht's forwards were, went to Markham but didn't pick up Charlie Natai who had a one-on-one -on -one with JJ Hanner and five yards from the line hard man to stop Johnny it's um it's been said to me a couple of times that on the pod here we can be a little bit soft on Connacht sometimes talking about you know close games that were close that maybe they should have won maybe overlooking a few things but um like if you look at some of the the tries they've conceded this season and some of the defeats they've had I'll go back through a few of the games here so we mentioned the the silly mistakes they made this week. You had uh, the week previous against the Bulls where not so much conceding, okay, they conceded a lot of tries, but they got themselves back in a position where they could and potentially should have got a fourth try bonus point. They give up the penalty turnover right at the very end for back chat at the referee. Uh, the week or the two weeks previous to, or the week previous to that down in the, down in Durban against the Sharks. They give up a try because Tiernan Halloran stopped running thinking there was a knock-on. Uh, prior to that against Edinburgh, they concede a crucial try down in the corner because they weren't switched on at a penalty and thought someone was going for the post. You coach 
adult teams and you coach teenagers at schools level. I'm going to specifically talk about the teenagers at schools level. If your teenagers were conceding tries like that or making mistakes like that as a coach, I imagine you would be pretty furious because you can yeah. you like you you can forgive like you can forgive teams getting cut out by a superior pack or being out muscled or just being beaten by more skillful players, but when mistakes are from just not switching on or things that are completely in your control, that's where the real frustration must lie. Yeah, and we've spoken about it before. I've been on previously, and I've spoken about that, particularly the uh, you know the one in South Africa and the one over in Edinburgh, uh, and even in Edinburgh, you know their kickoff or seat was really poor. They'd score and then they turn over the kickoff, um, and it's all very fixable. And those things are tiny momentum shifts, as JP has already said. Everything is within their own control, but they give teams easy momentum shifts into their own half. And they suck the life out of teams, you know, and they're playing incredible rugby when they have the ball. They look very, you know, their their style of play is excellent. Um, You know, Mac Hansen came back the other night and he was electric. Every time he touched the ball, he was sensational. But it's all those minor details that, as you say, are in their control that if they flick the switch there, they're going to be real contenders in this, I think, because in this competition because they're just leaking soft scores. And when you have that, um, you know, at, at schools level for me, I try and coach an understanding of momentum shifts, be it a, a yellow card or how important it is that five points or seven points stays five or seven points. It doesn't account to being five, three or worst case seven, five, if you can't get the kickoff, like all those things, are within their control and they need to sort them out because, you know, that would have been, and they've had a couple of really good kind of, um, you know, huge wins and statement wins, but like getting a bonus point last weekend away in South Africa after the previous week's, you know, result, that's big for them. Again, you know, this weekend, that's huge going into the Champions Cup and it gives them options as to how they want to, you know, we're going into Europe, how they want to, how they want to do that with rotation and stuff. But it's just very frustrating, and it must be incredibly frustrating for the coaching staff, but also players. Um, but they just need to roll their sleeves up and get them right. And as you say, everything is controllable. So when they get those controllables right, they're going to be very much in the mix in this competition. Onto a different competition than Champions Cup. They're the first of the the Irish provinces up this week, home against Bordeaux on Friday night. Um, I'd be interested to see what way they approach this because, like, they don't have the the same squad size that a, a Leinster or a Munster or Ulster do, and they're in a they're in a situation where they're obviously competing on both fronts. After the Champions Cup, they've got a pretty massive game away to Ulster just before Christmas. Both sides on four wins and three defeats. And I mean, for whoever wins or loses that game between Connacht and Ulster before Christmas, Christmas is going to feel a lot different one way or the other. JP, how do you see them actually approaching these two games? Like, should they be doing what we kind of criticize a lot of the English or French teams of doing over the years of of maybe taking a step back in the Champions Cup and and putting your eggs into the into the URC? Or is that is that just something that's not accepted in Ireland that you you absolutely go for the go for the Champions Cup, whether or not you're considered a, a contender to win it. Um, yeah, I. Uh, it's a tough, very tough one to call, Neil. It's a very tough one to call. Like if I was like the team that will probably face Bordeaux this weekend, um, there'll probably be changes in it. I don't know if you could call it a, a weakened team, if I'm being honest, because like you're probably looking at um, Bundy Aki will probably be back. Um, I don't know if Mac Hansen will, will play, but there are players that haven't maybe played last week or the week before that I'd imagine will get game time this weekend. And I don't think it takes away much from the Connacht playing squad that will play on Friday night. Depending on how that result goes, and you know, there's so many there's so many variables here, right? There's so many variables. Like if, how will Bordeaux um how will they approach it? Um if they get a result, I think they might go to Saracens looking for a result. Um, but it all depends really on that first weekend out. Like it's so many dynamic elements. Um, I definitely think that, yeah, the URC is probably their main focus, but I definitely don't think that they're 
going to approach the the Champions Cup with less vigor. Um, it's probably a good way of putting it. Yeah, and I, I think I think what they try and do is with the new, um, obviously with the the way the, the kind of Champions Cup is now, if you can concentrate on your home games, it gives a good old chance, you know. So if they go hell for letter this Friday. Um, see what comes out of that and then they might want to focus on Ulster again you're not weak in the side but you're giving guys that have huge amount of experience you know the likes to say from a front row perspective someone like Jordan Duggan that has played a lot of rugby give him opportunity in a very difficult place over in Saracens but you can rotate to guys that um you know, whether it's a toss up between JJ or um, you know, or or or, or Carthy, you make that decision then on on what, but you're not necessarily, as JP said, weakening the side, but you're giving guys opportunity and trying to prime them then for what is a real focus with where Ulster are at is 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 that that Christmas match. Like say for example, Neil, if you look at the the, the say the 10 like even the 9, 10, 12, 13 that played last weekend against Leinster, like the reality of it is you could have nine Colm Riley, you could have Jack Carty at 10, you could have Bundy Aki at 12 and Tom Farrell maybe at 13. Like that's that's an axis of a team that isn't going to take away much from. And you had maybe Paul Boyle that came onto the pitch against Leinster for the last 20 minutes. I thought he was very effective. For a man that hasn't played much rugby, he was key in one of the tries there. Um, he broke through the defensive line offload to Carl Ford. Um, like they, they're all players. I, I think Pete Wilkins does a very good job of managing the squad he has and trying to get to a level of performance consistently week in, week out. Like I know the results haven't necessarily all gone their way, but the level of performance from the squad that he has, I think he's he's doing it pretty well at the moment. Mm-hmm. And I do think he has a decent squad there that he can rotate or you know he's probably not settled because he's still getting to know these guys he's probably not settled on his first choice bar his internationals obviously you know Bundy and Mac and those guys but in Ria and Blade but you know outside of those you can kind of make a case for one or two guys in each position so you know he's not going to change 15 guys that's just not possible but if he makes five or six changes doesn't necessarily weaken the side I think that's different this I think that's the big difference with Connacht this year that you know they have seen a lot of traction and we've spoken about it before on here um you know about the development that they've done within the academies on homegrown players which is huge and they're starting to reap those rewards now and that's allowed them to have a bigger squad um and a and a proper squad that that they can compete so that is Connacht against uh, Connacht against Bordeaux Begla this Friday evening. Following week, they'll be up against Saracens. The rest of the teams in that pool one. Uh, so it's Connacht, Saracens, Bordeaux Begla, the Bulls, Leon, and Bristol. Connacht will be playing Leon and Bristol uh, in January in their other two games. Strange quirk of the the way they've done the draw this year. Obviously, they just had four top seeds across the board, fellas, and it's ended up in a situation where. Bristol, who finished, uh, I think ninth in the ninth in the Premiership, and only got in because of the uh, the London Irish situation into the Champions Cup, they found themselves in a position where they finished ninth in the Premiership, and they don't actually have to play a top seed in the in the pool stage of the Champions Cup because Saracens are that top seed, and you don't play teams for your own from your own country. So a strange little quirk in the in the draw there. We'll move on to Leinster though, because Leinster and La Rochelle this weekend is. It's the rematch of the rematch of the rematch going back as far as the the 2021 semifinals. And JP, it's okay. It's not a Champions Cup final. There's no trophy handed out at the end of this. And it's probably not going to go much of a way to getting rid of the pain from the last two final defeats against La Rochelle. But this feels like this feels like one Leinster need. Most definitely. Most definitely. If you look at the even the fixtures leading into this, right? Um, Leinster got the win um, in typical Leinster fashion. Last play of the game against Connacht, um, such as their resolve. I'd imagine when they look back over the video, there'd be large parts of that performance that they weren't, uh, they wouldn't be happy with. And the same can be said for the the fixture previous against Munster, right? Um, I would imagine that this needs to be a statement performance um, for Leinster. Um, probably a lot of teams think that they're not at where they should be 
or where they would themselves expect to be. Um, yeah, everything everything is going to, I funny feeling everything is going to go into this performance against La Rochelle. Um, obviously, the history is there, but just, you know, it's the competition in Leinster, you know, they, they want to win, they want to win it, right? La Rochelle are the defending, um, defending champions. I, I think there's going to be serious fireworks um, in that fixture next weekend. Johnny, it's a funny one. Like, I don't know, did you have a team back in your playing day, whether it was Leicester or Munster, just like a team where you were absolutely on the, the exact same level of them and on any given day should have been able to beat them, but for some reason or another just couldn't get over the line? Did you have any one of those down the years? Yeah, we probably had, a, particularly in the early days, it was kind of ourselves and Wasps um, that were generally in in kind of most finals or semi-finals. Um, and they towards the latter years you know um well in the early years kind of six seven you know they were very much that team that we just struggled to get and when you'd go there in league games in premiership games it was just to get get one under your belt so then it does the hoodoo is not there same at leinster towards um you know in kind of the early tens you know where we obviously beat them in the uh, in 2011, but then it was a very dry period for a long time in terms of, you know, winning those games. And it can, you know, kind of have that hoodoo on you. So it, you need to get one on the board at some stage. Um, if they got one on the board now, then they, you know, they, if they see them again, which I'm sure they will, um, you know, they just have that, they just have that on them. Um, and I think that's very important from, you know, mentally, but Leinster are going to be so much better again towards the end of the season than they are now. And they're still really good. But you look at all previous coaches that have come into kind of provinces, it's very rare that a coach, a new coach comes in and they hit the ground running. You know, you go back to Joe Smith. Joe Smith lost his first five on the bounce, six on the bounce. You go to Graham Rowntree and, and Prendy last year, you know, how they started. So everything that's going to start moving, Lentz are going to be, even though they're top quality now, they're going to be even better when it gets to the kind of the, the business end of the season because they're going through a slight change in their attack and obviously their defensive system. And Jack Neymar has said openly, well, I'm looking at changing a few things and he's on site now every day. So the things that he would probably have been looking at from afar during the World Cup or, you know, being in contact with Leo, they he's ironing all those things out now. So um, that is something that, that they will improve on and look, you know, the mental capacity of Jack to bring a team, even if they have lost, to where he's shown it with South Africa going over and over again. So, um, yeah, like it is important, but it's not the be all and end all. But I, it's as JP said, it's going to be, it's going to be a brilliant game on Sunday. Yeah, it's a great one just to to kick off the tournament with. And JP, like as as Johnny was saying there as well, like it's um, if you if you look back on previous seasons where. You know, Leinster's results maybe through the first six, seven weeks of a of a campaign. They're this year, they're definitely not where they were in previous seasons, but that's no harm at all if you consider how some of those seasons have panned out where their performances have probably tailed off later in the season. Really, really no harm whatsoever that they're winning games, but they're still you, you look at their performances and you can say for definite there's a lot still there to improve on. Yeah, and obviously, like that's a great great position to be in Neil and yeah I probably you're right in what you're saying that they'll learn more out of these uh, early fixtures this year than you know going out and hammering a team by 40 or 50 points like I always think that the measure of a team is that they'll find a way to win even if they're not playing well right and Connacht tested them Connacht really tested them on on um that's last Saturday um but it took them like 83 minutes on the clock was when Frawley scored that try. And the significance of that try as well, right? So it was, con or before he scored that try, Leinster only had one point out of that game, a losing bonus point. By Frawley scoring that try, they scored their fourth try and then they obviously get the, the, the winning. It went from a one-point game for them to a five-point game for mm. them. For a team that, you know, didn't execute well. And I think that's the measure of a team is, 
to be able to play like that but still know how to win. Um, yeah, they'll look back and they'll see that there's massive improvement to be made. But it's no good to any team to go out and just play teams and beat them by 20 points, 30 points, 40 points. They need to be tested. Um, I think Connacht tested them and Munster the week before. It definitely, um, definitely games that you would you would help that would help their development and help their improvement in areas to target for the for the movement from this point on. Mm. They've um not just this weekend, but for the next few weekends, there's an interesting choice to be made at, at out half. Johnny, it'll be really fascinating to see who who gets that nod with Ross Byrne. We know now, and he had surgery on that arm injury. He's going to be out until the new year. We don't know exactly when in the new year, but we're going to say you know January sometime. Uh, leading up towards Six Nations, but you have Harry Byrne, Kieran Frawley, and Sam Prendergast will probably get some minutes there along the way as well. More more than likely, though, if we're talking about starters over the next few weeks for these Champions Cup games and maybe the the big Interpro against Munster on St Stephen's Day, it's Harry Byrne or Kieran Frawley, and it's going to be really interesting to see which one of the two gets the nod there. Yeah, I think it's going to be Harry Byrne just by kind of reading between the lines in terms of, um, you know, the fact that Frawley has played three or four different positions already, obviously played 15 the other night. So they like that versatility and whether that is having him on the bench um, to come on and cover like he did so well when Ross went off against Munster. But it just shows you what one performance has done in, in pushing, you know, people are now saying, oh, why doesn't he get an extended run at 10? But, you know, people were talking about Harry Byrne like this kind of, you know, two years ago too. And he's got very little uh, kind of exposure. So it's, you know, it's one of those ones that what are they going to do? And then where does Frawley want to play? You know, he's just concerned. Sorry to interrupt, but that for me, that's the that's the big one, I think, at this stage with with Frawley, where a few years ago, he was the this brilliant utility man, but you're talking about someone who I think he's 25 now, maybe, maybe even around 26, where he's in his mid 20s at least, and it seems to be a situation for him where he tends to play pretty well wherever he is put, but he ends up in a situation where any any time there's a selection call like this to be made where his name is in the mix, he never seems to be at the front of that list. He he seems to be an an excellent option week on week in the number 23 jersey but has he got to a point now in his career where he needs to make a decision of I want to be an out half or I want to be a center or I want to be a full back and because otherwise he's just he's he's not going to be getting into these starting 15s for the big games yeah but that can go one of two ways so he can decide right I'm going to play here and then he doesn't get any game time so what do you want to do and I know from experience I suppose I was that kind of Jack of all trades, master of none myself. And it, but what you want to do is you want to be involved in those games. So you kind of just get on with it. Um, but, you know, if he's involved in in all the 23s for a cup and he, uh, for a Champions Cup and he gets, he, he gets on the pitch or he plays at 12, like he's always one injury away from a potential starting spot. Um, regardless, and that can be anywhere in the back line. So it's, it, it it's a really difficult one to to for him to navigate um and then it's it's up to where they see him as and i'm sure they're having those conversations um but he's a class player for me in my thing i think he's a real kind of kiwi style 12 where he can carry and he can distribute really well so that kind of second 5 8 style does that suit them? Then he's up against, you know, um, you know, then you throw him in the, the list of twelves they have. So Henshaw, him, Jamie. I know Jamie's we spoke about Jamie before, Jamie's injured now. Um, Night tie. So it he's in a, a backlog, even whatever position you put him in, and he's probably coming up second or third choice. So he just wants to play. And if he is seen as someone that can't be outside of 23, that probably puts him in the Ireland window too. So, yeah, it's 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 a really difficult one for him to navigate, but he is playing really, really well wherever he's playing at the moment. Yeah, it's a tough one for any professional player, JP, to navigate where you obviously want to you want to maximise your chances of, of getting into a team. And even if you have a preferred position as well, you, you don't want to you don't want to go too narrow in terms of the position you want to play either. 
Yeah, and like Johnny's Johnny's bang on there. Like from a coach's perspective, um, if you have a guy that's coming saying I only want to play ten, um, like it's 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 all or nothing. Then you either start him at ten or depending on what way you pick the squad. Like if you're going for a six-two split, um, which Leinster did last weekend, there's no room. Like you'd be looking for a utility back on the bench rather than uh, carrying a a a, ded- a dedicated out half. So like. For a coach, it's easier to have someone with that versatility in the match day squad that can slot in and depending on what position they say for all in this, this scenario goes into, you might be able to manoeuvre or manipulate your back line elsewhere. Um, yeah, it, it's tough. It's difficult. I, I don't know like what maybe Nian Barr's um, opinion will be. Um, like for all these probably the biggest 10 that they have down there at the moment and I know Jack Neenbart would have like a huge defensive focus I don't know if he'd maybe like a bigger man standing in there at 10 um, I'd like a, I think he's maybe 15 and a half stone he's 6 foot 1 or 2 mm. but has fantastic skills on top of that you know a great ball player um, you know he would easily slot in as a ball playing 12 like what, what Johnny said you know to to release the outside channels there in, in Leinster's attack as a, as a second distributor Um. He has got a lot of strings to his ball. I'd, I'd like to see like maybe what Jack Neenbar thinks or what his perception will be or if he puts him in. Because let's face it, when they play La Rochelle this weekend, there's going to be serious heavy traffic coming down that 10 channel. Um, Whoever's going to be there, you know. Mm. Um, I asked Leo Cullen yesterday, who's the next man up at number 10 uh, this week? And he said they're still thinking it over. But he said it with a, a bit of a smile that made me think that uh, they, they already have thought it over and they know what's happening this weekend. But anyway, we'll find out this Sunday. We'll move on to, to Munster. Munster taking on Bayon uh, this Saturday evening. That game's live on RT2 and RT Player. Um, Last weekend, JP, a mix of good and bad against Glasgow, a 40-29 win. Uh, on the good side, the attack scored some absolutely cracking tries, six in total. But I do want to focus on the other side of the pitch specifically for you, where if I could bring you back into your playing days with Connacht and whether or not you won or lost, if you as a forward had been involved in a team that conceded five tries and all five straight from the mall, how much would you be dreading the the forwards meeting on a Monday morning? Uh, the meeting is one thing I'd be dreading, but the, the unit session on the Tuesday morning is definitely what you'd be dreading. Um <laughs> It's 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 funny, right? Because traditionally, you know, going back throughout the years, you'd associate Munster with, um, well, you wouldn't associate him with con- conceding that amount of mall tries. And what uh, what I like about Graham Roundtree as well is he's very he's always very honest in his poach match uh, appraisals on RT. Um, like, take what they did in context: the, the win over Glasgow, who were URC leaders at the time, and they get a bonus point win. Graham Roundtree was quick to say, yeah, look, that's great and, you know, fantastic effort by the boys. But as a forward himself and playing with the club that he played with, I think he knows that um, conceding tries in that fashion are not good enough. And he, I think he mentioned, yeah, look, we're going to be defending malls all year if yeah. we if we can't, if we can't address it. Um, because, yeah, look, Bayon, um, not, kind, not sure what kind of a team they'll send over, what kind of shape it'll be in. But the one thing that most French packs will try and do is, you know, an upfront physical confrontation. And if they get the tape of that Glasgow game and and see how the nature of how Munster conceded those tries, I'd have a funny feeling that any chance they get to put it into the corner, that's what they'll be doing. Yeah, we asked him on Friday night, had he had a chance to have a, a quick look at Bayonne so far? And he said he had and- he said one thing about him is they love them all and he rolled his eyes. <laughs> but um, Johnny, we'll, we'll look at the good stuff though because in terms of attack, there was a lot of really, really, really good stuff. Following on from uh, a promising attacking performance again against as well against Leinster the previous week where maybe they didn't get the scores that they, they might have deserved, but it came together against Glasgow in attack last Friday night, particularly in the first quarter of the game where they scored three tries in the opening 15 minutes that ultimately really was the probably the winning and losing of it. Glasgow could never get back within that one score to to really trouble them on the scoreboard. It's starting to all come together on attack and they're looking a lot more like the, the team that finished last season, aren't they? 
Yeah, they are. Yeah, uh, they're moving the ball really well. Um, you know, having those back rowers in the wider channel, you know, you see what Tom O'Hearn does when you have footballing back rows and you're able to manipulate the space so that they're getting ball um, in those wider channels. And even when they are getting them and their numbers up, they're, they're mismatches. So you have a forward running out of back, which is, you know, winger trying to tackle a back row was never a, never a nice thing for that winger. Um, but yeah, they're, and they're being really accurate as well. Like, you know, their, their basics are bang on. So they're catch passing those wider channels uh, the ability to play both sides of the ball every time. Um, and then they have the old dark arts as well in terms of, um, you know, you know, um, like Craig Casey basically hurdling a fella to try and get a, you know, to get a penalty. You know, he doesn't need to do that, but he's also been held in there. That player has been held in by Gavin Coombs. You know, their, their subtlety at that breakdown is really good from an attacking perspective, you know, giving the referee pictures that, and also when referees look at, at, at Munster now, they're a team that the referees go, they want to play. So they want quick ball. So if uh, the opposition uh, tacklers are rolling towards the nine, well, that's going to hinder how they want to play. That's obviously a tactic by, um, by the opposition. And with those subtleties that Munster are doing, it's giving the referee really easy pictures to just ping guys. And, you know, that's that's really, really smart. But I've been really impressed with everyone's catch pass in those, in those wider channels. They're obviously doing a lot of uh, core skill work, 2v1s, 3v2s, across 1 to 23. They're executing um, and executing really, really highly. Um, and again, it's just kind of the foundations that, um, you know, Prendy would have put in last year at the start and they're all starting to come into fruition now. And when they get, you know, again, they're going to be in the mix, but like they're going to keep improving as as they go, particularly when they sort their 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 mall out, um, their mall D out. Um, that is something and it's going to be on their minds now because everyone's talking about it. It's been alluded to a bit throughout throughout games. We've spoken about it before, but I think it was... And when it comes to kind of home semifinals and quarterfinals in the URC, how important is that bonus point that Glasgow get in the second half going to be on a head-to-head or, you know, like those points at this stage, they add up and they matter on those head-to-head things with teams that are going to be at the top you know, you know, top three, top four, they matter. Mm. And that's gonna that's gonna hurt. You know, that should have been a five one, a five nil victory with how it was in the first 20, 30 minutes to to give up to be five one. Yeah, it's that that's gonna be a, a tough one for them to swallow. Yeah, certainly. Um in terms of their their overall look, Johnny, in the in the Champions Cup this season, okay they they got some great silverware last season. Things are going well, but you know as well as anyone that when you play for Munster, you're judged on how you do in Europe. And looking over the last four years, uh, 2019 was the last time Munster got beyond a, a quarter final. They missed out in the pool stage in tw- or went out in the pool stage in 2020. 2021 and tw- uh, 2021, it was a last 16 defeat. 2022 quarter final. And our last sixteen last sixteen defeat last year as well. Um, for as well as things have gone for, for Graham Roundtree and Co. over the last 12, 18 months, they have to make a step up in Europe. And I'm not saying they have to get to a semi-final this year, but they have to show improvements. Uh, I think this season is probably the best way of putting it. Yeah, they have to have to be contenders. Um, and based on the draw and and, and everything how it is now who knows what they're going to have in the last 16 or quarter final based on, on results. But like they, they, their top seeds, obviously with only top four seeds, that kind of creates, there's some, some whopper uh, kind of knockout stages on who they could get or, or, or that based on, on results. But um, this is, this year they'll very much be, and they do every year, like there's a massive shift in um, in intensity for all European weeks across all clubs, but particularly in Munster, because that's what the history of the, of the club is based upon from the early 2000s and on. And, you know, they, 
there's a couple of guys, older guys in that uh, in that squad that you know are really going to be targeting a journey in, in over the next couple of years, and um, I think they're in a really good space um, from an attacking perspective to to do that. But as we said already, they have to you know they have to sort out a couple of things, particularly their mall. But then, like this is 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 a year where they can be really really competitive and be contenders in that. Uh, in the Champions Cup, yeah, and JP crucial like they have a head coach who who knows the value of the of the tournament. He said it often enough since since he came in initially in in twenty nineteen. Uh, never mind even since uh, being appointed as head coach, but even go back to Roundtree's playing days with Leicester. Like you know, they were very much a team that that had a big value in the in the Champions Cup. So I don't think there's any fear that that value is going to uh, be diminished anytime soon in Munster. No, I don't think so. Sorry, Neil. The light is gone from here. You're gone. Um, yeah, like I actually remember going down to it was Thoman Park at the time, and it was I think it was Leicester Tigers that beat Munster for the first time in a home. Um, Were you playing that home. day, Johnny? Yeah, I was involved in the squad. Yeah, I wasn't, but I was there. Yeah, it was kind Leo. Of yeah, Leo Cullen, Shane Jennings, they were all playing for Leicester Tigers that day. I was actually at that game. Um. Yeah. It was like it. It's the, the the history. Yeah. It's so rich, and of course, what 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 Johnny said. Everything goes up a goes up a notch. I think Munster have the squad. Um, and more importantly, I think they have the belief in themselves. Like they will take so much confidence out of what they what they did last year against. I won't say against all odds, but like there was questions being asked of them throughout the year. They went down to South Africa, um, got results on the road, and it's it's like. They, I won't say they came back as a different group, but they found out who they are and what they're capable of, and they believed in themselves to do it. I think if they bring that belief into the European uh, competition, um, yeah, they can definitely kick on, most most definitely. Um, so that game is Saturday evening live on RT2 and RT Player, and commentary as well on RT Radio 1, so tune in for that. We'll finish up on Ulster and JP. Uh, last week yourself and Birch were on and we were pretty much saying we can't really get a read on Ulster and I think that's kind of continued on with the, the defeat to Edinburgh but as frustrating as it probably was for Ulster just to go back on something we were talking about a few minutes ago about uh, the importance of every single little point in the URC the game is over and James Hume crosses for a try for Ulster to to get them back into bonus point territory, but also to give them a four try bonus point. So, even though they lose that game in the flash of a pan in the in the last minute, pretty much they went from a situation where they were getting nothing to getting two at the end of the season. That could be very, very, very important. Of course, of course, Neil. Yeah, it will. It it will be important. Um, but overall, I think Len or I think Ulster will be disappointed. Um, to lose to to Edinburgh. Um, like with the team, with the players that they have up there, you know, I I think they have some fantastic rugby players up there. Um, it seems that they're not able to consistently perform for the eighty minutes, right? And we've seen it. We've seen it a number of games this season already, where they come out, um, they come out hot out of the blocks, you know, rack up scores early in the game. And it's like they, they they switch off um after that. And it's 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 really hard to put a finger on it. Um like people talk about, you know, have obviously you have to be physically fit to play the game, but you have to be mentally fit as well, Neil. And I'd question like question their headspace. Um we talked earlier on here about like like pivotal moments and key moments in the game. Another way of saying that is, you know, when you get a score or when you get, you know, when you do something that gives you a leg up in the game, what's your next job after it? You mentioned about, say, Connacht not receiving drop-offs um, after scoring a try. Like, it's just to focus on the next job, focus on the next thing, and whatever that might be. It might be a big defensive set. It might be, okay, we don't let them get an exit effectively out of their 22, or we don't give away a penalty to let them out of their 22 and the ball back. Whatever it is, it seems like that focus on the next job, the next job, after after a good start or after you know a scoring a try whatever it is getting points on the board it just seems like it's it's not there and we saw Dan uh, Dan McFarlane mentioning in the in in the media there about 
the intensity in training. Mm. Um, like it's big of him to come out and say that, but there can't be an expectation of like you play how you train, essentially. And if you're not, if you're not testing yourself, if you're not pushing yourself in training, it's 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 and like from a team perspective. It's a minor miracle if you pull it off at the weekend. If you expect the team to execute on something that they haven't done already, haven't done throughout the course of the week, for them to come out and do it at the at the weekend, um, I don't know who like is it senior players within the squad that need to take ownership of that, um, supported by the coach and staff. I I I don't know. I don't know, but I know the I know it would have been very disappointing to lose up in the Kingspan to Edinburgh last weekend. It was the, yeah, it's, the training it's part, Johnny, is the is the concerning element, isn't it? That line from Dan McFarland. Yeah, and like uh, I would have been uh, worked under Dan for Ireland A um, on a summer tour, and like Dan is a really open, honest coach, uh, really nice fella. Um, but like for him to say that, you know, he's obviously addressed that with his with his players too before saying it in the media or. He's calling them out publicly, which can go one of two ways. Um, yeah, it's just weird. And like you know, intensity and training doesn't have to be you know, you know, banging off each other every day. Um, you know, for sixty minutes and doing a load of contact, you can have real high intensity sessions based on you know just in terms of ball and play that kind of stuff. So there's obviously something amiss. Um, but as you said, they're eking out those points, those two points, they matter. But at the same time, there's just something that's missing. I, I, and it's very hard to put your your uh, your finger on it, whether that's consistency of training, do people uh, consistency of, of, of selection, um, which leads to people in training then not knowing where they stand within the group or, or is there not enough focus? Okay, well, if I train really well, I'd put myself in the mix for selection. Um, it's very hard and and they are the only people that know behind, you know, behind closed doors um, what is actually going on. But it's interesting and it just kind of leaves, and we've spoken about this before, that Ulster are kind of nearly men all the time. You know, they're in semi-finals or quarter-finals, particularly of the URC, but they haven't got over the line. And everyone was saying, well, this is a year where they have a decent enough squad that they can be proper contenders and not just nearly men. And that's kind of the frustrating part when you look at it and you look at the Ulster performances, the consistency is not there. The consistency is not there in selection either. So what? How how do they fix that? Did they just say right? These are our top twenty five players. They're going to play for the next block four games on the trot. Here you go, and then we're only changing up because of of um, of injury. And then you say to the 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 rest of the squad, right lads, training is your time. This is your moment. Over the next four weeks, we're going to go hell for leather at each other. We're not going to kick the crap out of each other, but we're going to go at it. Um and. Do they do that? I, I I don't know. It's very hard to pinpoint, but it's just it's interesting for someone like Dan of all people to come out and say that publicly, and everyone's talking about it again over the, since the, for the last three days. So obviously he's hoping for a really big reaction um, from a performance perspective. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, does he get that reaction this weekend? So they're taking on Bath in the opening round of the Champions Cup on Saturday. They're rassing the following week. And then you're into the Christmas Interpros, where they're gonna have uh they're gonna have Connacht at home, followed by Leinster away on on New Year's Day, and then into the second round of Champions Cup games, where they'll be taking on uh, Toulouse away, and they'll also have uh, Harlequins at home. Very very last point on on Ulster, they've caught themselves in a really tricky situation in the Champions Cup this year by the look of the draw as well, where uh as we mentioned previously, where teams in the same league don't play each other. So their other URC representative in in the pool are, are Cardiff, who finished, I think, 10th in the URC last season. They're, no disrespect to them, they they're, they look like being the worst team in the competition. But Johnny Ulster found themselves in a situation where all their other pool opponents get to play Cardiff, but Ulster don't get to. Ulster have to play Toulouse, Bath, Rassing and Harlequins. And like if you're... If you're Dan McFarland, okay, maybe there's stuff in your control as well you're not happy about, but Jesus, you must be cursing the look of that draw. 
Yeah, the, look, the two main competitions over the last six six months, be it this one and the World Cup, you're kind of looking at the draw going, how does that happen? <laughs> um, you know, for me on the draw, um, I think they had they've had a win, win, winning formula for for years. Um, those Christmas back to backs, um, you know, the week before Christmas in the Heineken Cup, you know, when it was called Heineken Cup, uh, were unbelievable because it was only half time yeah. and. I don't see why they needed to change the pools of four. Um, you know, obviously there's some reason behind it, but then when you look at that, you would say on the laws of averages, all those, all their other opponent, opponents have potentially five points on, on on the board against Cardiff. Certainly a win because of you know their performance for, performance so far. Yeah, it's just I, I I don't know I don't get it I I don't get why why they keep trying to change when they have they've had a working model that has grown the game that people are really look forward to all the time, um and they have those Christmas back to backs in those pool stages that were were unbelievable ties to be involved in and to be a, a spectator in and hmm. yeah and there was always an edge like I remember. Perpignan scored in the last minute, JJ scores in the last minute. And like the stuff that was right that was written in the French media about us and they're coming to us the following week, it was huge. Like it, it, and that that goes for you know the Ospreys battles over the years, you know, Connacht would have uh, had some as well. It's just massive, but I don't see what why what what why change a winning formula. But anyway, look, I above my pay grade. How do you feel? How do you feel on it, JP? I'll give the yeah, final, just, I'll give the final word to you. Yeah, just to reiterate, um, all Johnny's uh statements, I completely agree. Um, if it's not broken. Why try and fix it? Um, and yeah, like the the, the pool the pool games um do throw up some fantastic draws, some fantastic um fixtures, and now you look at you know a team like Ulster that. They find the, they find themselves in the in the position that they're in. They're playing European heavyweights for for the next block of games and after Christmas. And all those other teams are like what you mentioned, playing Cardiff. Um, yeah, it's it, it, it's a it's a curious setup. And yeah, my opinion would be like if, if why change it? Why why go this way? Um, if it was if it was working perfectly fine before, but like what Johnny said, it's still, it's way above my pay grade too. Yeah. Well, look, we'll see how it goes this weekend. They are the Champions Cup fixtures for this weekend. Starting out Friday night, Connacht taking on Bordeaux Begla at the sports ground. Saturday afternoon, uh, middle of the afternoon, I think it's about three o'clock kickoff. It is Bath hosting Ulster. Uh, after five, then Munster are at home against uh, Munster home against Bayonne. And then on Sunday afternoon, Leinster away to La Rochelle. That's your first round games. That's it for the podcast this week. Thank you very much to Johnny Murphy and to JP Cooney again. And we'll be back with you this time next week. See you then.